Good morning. I'd like to welcome you to another class on lessons from the rivers of the Bible. The Nile River is not mentioned in the Bible as often as the Jordan or even the Euphrates, but it played a huge role in the history of Israel. Most of the time when I thought of the Nile River, Egypt came to mind. The Nile certainly is prominent in Egypt, but as the longest river in the world, it touches some 10 African nations on its way to the Mediterranean Sea. The source of the Nile River is generally considered to be Jenga, Uganda. Some who have traveled to Uganda on one of the Walter Hill mission trips have visited Jenga and witnessed the water bubbling up in Lake Victoria. I think of the Nile River as being a huge river, and it is, but it is not as large as the Mississippi River, and it is much smaller than the Amazon River in terms of the amount of water flowing in it. Because of the annual flooding that occurs, much silt is carried by the Nile River to the rich delta, making it excellent for farming. Outside the Nile River Valley and the delta area, Egypt is primarily desert. As such, about 95% of Egypt's population lives within a few miles of the Nile River today. Last week, Paul's lesson dealt with the wrestling match between Jacob and God at the Jabbok River. From the time of that event to today's lesson, well over 400 years has passed by. It is important to recall that Joseph, who had been sold into slavery by his brothers, rose to be second in command of the Egyptian empire, being only behind Pharaoh himself. Now, 430 years later, we find the Israelites enslaved to the Egyptians. One command the Israelites had been able to obey while in Egyptian captivity was the command to be fruitful and multiply. Because the Israelite or Hebrew population had grown so large, the Egyptians were leery of them. The Pharaoh of Exodus was not the same Pharaoh who had placed so much power and trust in the Joseph. Exodus 1.8 tells us that this Pharaoh did not know Joseph. Although three general dates have been proposed as the time the Exodus occurs, we will not delve into which of these time periods is more likely since the dates do not affect the point of today's lesson. Whichever Pharaoh was in power at this time, he made three cruel attempts to reduce the Israelite population. First, he made the work of the Hebrews more difficult and bitter. He figured if he made the Hebrews miserable, they would not prosper as much with additional children. Second, when Pharaoh saw that the Hebrews were having more children, not, not less, he ordered the midwives to kill all the males as they were born. Two midwives with Hebrew names shrewdly told Pharaoh that the Hebrew women were strong and gave birth before they could arrive. The population of the Israelites continued to increase. It is so profound that the names of these two midwives, Shifra and Pua, are named in God's book for all eternity, and the name of this powerful Pharaoh is never mentioned. Two lowly Hebrew women who feared God were able to outwit this mighty ruler of Egypt. Exodus 1.12 speaks of Pharaoh's final attempt to suppress the Hebrews. Then Pharaoh commanded all his people, Every son that is born to the Hebrews you shall cast into the Nile, but you shall let every daughter live. Many innocent babies were put to death by Pharaoh and the Egyptians. A day would come when the Egyptians would sow what they reaped by this evil action. As we look at Exodus chapter 2, we are introduced to a surviving baby who rose to become one of the greatest characters in the Bible, Moses. This last attempt to remove a threat to the throne is repeated later in history. Do you recall the time? Shortly after Jesus was born, it was Herod who ordered all the baby boys under the age of two to be killed. Only Jesus would surpass Moses as the greatest baby ever to survive such an evil plot. Let's read Exodus chapter 2, verses 1 through 10. 
Now a man from the house of Levi went and took as his wife a Levite woman. The woman conceived and bore a son, and when she saw that he was a fine child, she hid him for three months. When she could hide him no longer, she took for him a basket made of bulrushes and daubed it with bitumen and pitch. She put the child in it and placed it among the reeds by the river bank. And his sister stood at a distance to know what would be done to him. Now the daughter of Pharaoh came down to bathe at the river while her young women walked beside the river. She saw the basket among the reeds and sent her servant woman and she took it. And when she opened it, she saw the child, and behold, the baby was crying. She took pity on him and said, This is one of the Hebrews' children. Then his sister said to Pharaoh's daughter, Shall I go and call you a nurse from the Hebrew women to nurse the child for you? And Pharaoh's daughter said to her, Go. So the girl went and called the child's mother. And Pharaoh's daughter said to her, Take this child away and nurse him for me, and I will give you your wages. So the woman took the child and nursed him. And when the child grew older, she brought him to Pharaoh's daughter, and he became her son. She named him Moses because, she said, I drew him out of the water. It is noted that Moses came from the tribe of Levi. Later in Exodus, we learn that priests and those serving in the tabernacle and later in the temple were to come from the tribe of Levi. In fact, Aaron, Moses' older brother, would become the first high priest for the people of Israel. Moses' mother, later identified as Jochebed, did the best she could at keeping her son, but as Moses grew older, it became increasingly difficult to keep him concealed from the Egyptians. As a last resort, she made a wicker-type basket made of bulrushes and covered it with tar and pitch, placed baby Moses in the basket, and set it out to float on the Nile River. Can you see the irony in this action? Pharaoh commanded all male babies be thrown into the Nile River to destroy them, but here Moses' mother puts him in the Nile River to save him. Moses' mother further instructs her daughter Miriam, Moses' older sister, to watch and see what would happen to him. Another thing to note about this basket, the word basket in Exodus comes from the Hebrew word theba, or teba. This word is used in connection with only one more event in the Hebrew Bible, and that is with Noah's ark. Both the ark of Noah and the basket of Moses saved lives and started new beginnings. We see that the basket while floating among the reeds was seen by the daughter of Pharaoh. After having her servants retrieve the basket, she looked inside to find a baby in it, a Hebrew baby. The baby was crying and this daughter of Pharaoh had pity on him. The Bible does not inform us of how old Pharaoh's daughter was or what her name was but she wanted this baby for herself. One must wonder what her daddy, Pharaoh, thought of this idea. Even more remarkably, Moses' own birth mother, Jochebed, was able to continue nursing him and got paid to do so. Babies in those days were not weaned as early as they are today, so Moses' Hebrew mother may have had him for several years before turning him over to Pharaoh's daughter. During this time, Moses undoubtedly learned of his heritage and the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, and the promises God made to them. Pharaoh tried his best to keep Israel from multiplying, but failed in all of his attempts. Moses could have been one of thousands of male babies born that year, but because Pharaoh commanded that all of them be killed, the one baby who survived would be the one who would lead his people out of Egypt. Not only that, this one male child grew up in the house of Pharaoh right under his nose. Moses is finally named in scripture in verse 10. Pharaoh's daughter, Moses' Egyptian mother, gives him his name. You can see that the elements of the name Moses and other Egyptian kings' names, such as Ramses and Thutmose. 
From the end of Exodus 2.10, there is over a 30-year recorded gap in the life of Moses. Interestingly, it is the martyr Stephen in Acts 7 that provides us a little more information about Moses' upbringing. Acts 7.22 informs us, And Moses was instructed in all the wisdom of the Egyptians, and he was mighty in words and deeds. Moses likely lived a privileged life as an adolescent. He was educated in the ways of the superior Egyptians. However, we read in Hebrews 11, 24 through 26, that Moses as a young man going into adulthood rejected the treasures of Egypt. He renounced his being called the son of Pharaoh's daughter. And Stephen states in Acts 7, 25, that Moses viewed himself as a deliverer of his people long before God called him to this task. Moses never forgot that he was born a Hebrew. Exodus 2, 11 and 12 records, One day when Moses had grown up, he went out to his people and looked on their burdens, and he saw an Egyptian beating a Hebrew, one of his people. He looked this way and that, and seeing no one, he struck down the Egyptian and hit him in the sand. Stephen tells us in the book of Acts that Moses was 40 years old when this incident occurred. Moses thought he had gotten away with this act until the next day when he tried to break up a fight between two Hebrews. One of the Hebrews asked if he intended to kill him as well. When Moses realized his actions had become known, he fled to Egypt to Midian. It was wise of Moses to get out of Egypt because verse 15 of Exodus chapter 2 tells us Pharaoh was furious and wanted Moses killed. For the purposes of this lesson, we're going to move quickly through the next 40 years of Moses' life as a shepherd in the land of Midian. This map explains the general location of Midian and of Mount Sinai. It is worth mentioning here that Moses married a woman named Zipporah and had two sons. He worked as a shepherd for his father-in-law, Reuel, also known at times as Jethro or Hobab. Stephen tells us in Acts 7 that Moses, at the age of 80, is called by God to lead his people out of Egypt. In Exodus 3 and 4, Moses responds to God five times, presenting excuses as to why he should not be the one to lead the Israelites out of Egypt. I would encourage you to look at these excuses in more detail as Moses presents them in Exodus 3 and, and 4 and see how God responds back to him. Moses' first response was, Who am I? But Moses said to God, Who am I that I should go to Pharaoh and bring the children of Israel out of Egypt? Exodus 3.11 Moses' second response was, Who are you? Then Moses said to God, If I come to the people of Israel and say to them, The God of your fathers has sent me to you, and they ask me, What is his name? What shall I say to them? Exodus 3.13 The third response of Moses was, They will not believe me or listen to me. Then Moses answered, But behold, they will not believe me or listen to my voice, for they will say, The Lord did not appear to you. Exodus 4 verse 1. The fourth response was, I am not eloquent. But Moses said to the Lord, O oh my Lord, I am not eloquent either in past or since you have spoken to your servant, but I am slow of speech and of tongue. Exodus 4.10. Do you remember Stephen was able to declare in Acts chapter 7 verse 22 that Moses was mighty in words and deeds? The fifth response was, please send someone else. But he said, oh my Lord, please send someone else. Exodus 4.13. Moses the man offered excuses of God the creator as to why he should not be the one to lead the Israelites out of captivity. God had been extremely patient with Moses as he registered his first four excuses. When Moses asked God to send someone else, Scripture says God burned with anger. Seeing that we'd have to push Moses just a little harder, he provided his brother Aaron to speak for him. 
The time for excuses was over, and Moses and Aaron departed for Egypt to do as God wanted. Upon their arrival in Egypt, Moses and Aaron first met with the elders of the Israelites. Aaron spoke the words God had spoken to Moses and performed the signs or miracles God had showed them earlier. The Israelites believed what Moses and Aaron told them and worshiped God. That belief did not last long. Just a short time later, after Pharaoh increased the workload of the Hebrews, they started their complaining to Moses. Moses approaches God again, complaining that since the Hebrews do not believe he can deliver them, why would Pharaoh believe him? When Moses and Aaron meet Pharaoh for the first time, Pharaoh asks Moses in Exodus 5-2, Who is the Lord, that I should obey his voice and let Israel go? I do not know the Lord, and moreover, I will not let Israel go. Pharaoh will soon wish he had not been so arrogant and prideful regarding the God who rules over the entire world. Pharaoh would come to know the Lord, but in a most painful way. When Moses returned to Pharaoh the second time, the plagues began. We read in Exodus chapter 7, beginning in verse 14. Then the Lord said to Moses, Pharaoh's heart is hardened. He refuses to let the people go. Go to Pharaoh in the morning, and as he is going out to the water, stand on the bank of the Nile to meet him, and take in your hand the staff that turned into a serpent. And you shall say to him, The Lord, the God of the Hebrews, sent me to you, saying, Let my people go, that they may serve me in the wilderness. But so far you have not obeyed. Thus says the Lord, By this you shall know that I am the Lord. Behold, with that staff that is in my hand, I will strike the water that is in the Nile, and it shall turn into blood. Verse 20, Moses and Aaron did as the Lord commanded. In the sight of Pharaoh and the sight of his servants, he lifted up the staff and struck the water in the Nile, and all the water in the Nile turned into blood. Verse 22, But the magicians of Egypt did the same by their secret arts. So Pharaoh's heart remained hardened, and he would not listen to them as the Lord had said. Moses had his doubts about his abilities and qualification, but when God started using him to implement the plagues, Moses had one goal in mind, to get the Israelites out of Egypt. So how did God mold Moses into the leader that he became? God chose Moses for a special task of getting his people out of slavery. Can we be chosen by God to perform a special task? We may be uniquely able to reach someone with the gospel or perform a service for someone. How do we know what God wants us to do? We must be willing to be used by God. We will never know what God has chosen us to do if we never choose him. Second, God prepared Moses for a special task. Moses' preparation was providential. Moses did not, did not know he was being prepared, yet God was using circumstances in Moses' life to give him a more role for leadership. In a time when all male babies were being killed, Moses' mother was able to nurse him and teach him about the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Because of this crucial time in Moses' life, he identified with the enslaved Hebrews more than he did with his adopted Egyptian mother. He was prepared with the time he spent in the Egyptian palace. He learned their language, their education, their customs. This enabled Moses to enter Pharaoh's palace many years later to demand that the Hebrews be released. He was also prepared by being a shepherd in Midian in the wilderness area. The headstrong Moses who fled Egypt became more patient. He learned what it was like to live in the wilderness. Could you imagine a city slicker leading a couple million of people around in the wilderness? Are you looking at your life experiences to see where you can serve? You may be surprised at what you could do if you set your mind on it. God called Moses for this special task at the burning bush. Does God call us today? He does, 
not miraculously as he did Moses, but providentially through circumstances in life. When we are moved to accept challenges presented to us by God and accept those challenges, that is when and how we are called by God. Can we say the no to God's calling? Yes, we can by refusing to use what God has given us, and that is a sad thing to do. God empowered Moses for a special task. God's primary response to Moses' reluctance and excuses was, I will be with you. When we try to do God's will and respond to his call, he will empower us to accomplish his task. I must give credit to Coy Roper and his Truth for Today commentary on Exodus for much of the material used in today's lesson. I want to close out with an excerpt from his book. Moses stood before Pharaoh and told him, God says, let my people go. What a change had come over Moses. He was not the Israelite slave that he might have been if Pharaoh's decree had not caused him to be placed in the river. He was not the brash, arrogant, Egyptianized prince he would have been without his experiences in Midian. He was not the scared fugitive from Egypt or the smelly shepherd of Midian that he would have been if God had not called him. He was not any of these, yet he was all of them and more. He was God's person, God's spokesman, God's prophet, the equal and even superior of Pharaoh, unafraid, ready to do God's will, and prepared for the task of leading a rebellious people for 40 years in the wilderness. What great deeds God accomplished through him. We may not be called to free a nation from slavery, but whether we are rich or poor, well-suited or inadequate, God can accomplish great things through us if we allow him to use us. Thank you for joining us in this lesson today. Again, I would invite you to continue watching for the next two to three minutes to view some questions from today's lesson. They are true and false and multiple choice. I hope you enjoy them.